Good morning, and thanks for joining us this week. In response to the governor's announcement last Monday, all of our events at DCC have either gone online or have been canceled. Watch Pastor Tim's announcement about the changes on last Wednesday's DCC Today by going to dcchurch.org and clicking on the banner. If you have any questions at all, contact your group leader or give us a call in the office at 360-683-7333. This afternoon at one o'clock, Dr. Brian Miller will be leading a workshop on Zoom where he will dig further into the scientific evidence and the state of the debate between intelligent design and evolution. To join this workshop, be sure to register in advance by going to dcchurch.org and clicking on the banner. And now, here's Pastor Tim with a special invitation. Thanks, Colleen. I don't know about you, but this is a very different kind of Thanksgiving for Burnett and I. We had to cancel all of our plans with family, and so we're on our own this Thanksgiving. And that's okay, but it's also nice to see people. So we've decided that Thanksgiving Day at 12 noon and again at 5 p.m., Burnett and I are going to be online for about 15 minutes with a little Zoom meeting. And I'd like to invite any of you that uh, would like to connect on Thanksgiving Day to join us. Uh, if you'd like to do that, just contact the church office or go to dcchurch.org, click the banner there for the Thanksgiving blessing, and sign up. We will get you the Zoom link so you can join us. We'll have a few minutes to just say hello to each other, uh, share a devotional thought, and pray for our meal. So if you celebrate at lunchtime, We'll be there at noon. If you celebrate at dinner time, we'll be there at 5 p.m. But uh, either way, I would look forward to having you join us for a bit this coming Thanksgiving. Well, speaking of Thanksgiving, let's turn our hearts now toward worship. Let me pray and then let's sing. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the many things that you have given us that we truly are thankful for. Even in a difficult year, Father, still your mercies, your grace, they are new every morning. I ask that you would help our hearts to be directed and focused on you now and to lift our voices, even in our homes, in worship and song. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings, my brothers and sisters. Let's open in a word of prayer before we sing. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to be here with you and with our brothers and sisters, praising your name, worshiping you. We bring our whole selves to you this morning, Father, in worship, and we lay it on the altar, everything we have, because you are worthy of all that we have to give and bring to you today. So free our hearts, free our spirits to worship you, and thank you for your presence in this place. We just long to spend some time with you this morning, worshiping at your feet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
such good news in our day and age, right? That God is still on the throne, that he rules, that he reigns. And no matter how many differences seem to divide this crazy world we live in, there's, there's some solid truths that we can all agree on as brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what this next song is about. What do you believe in this morning?
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And grace. Jesus, there's no one who can compare with you. No one. You are matchless, without equal. You're everything good we know how to sing about. You're our righteousness. Hmm. Our kinsman redeemer. You rescued us when we were stuck in pits of sin and despair. You found each and every one of us, called our names, and lifted us out of the darkness and into your glorious light. What a privilege. What a pleasure to bring praise to your matchless name. We sing it now 
and we'll sing it for all eternity. Glorious, glorious Jesus, you are great, and we praise your name. This morning, I am pleased to introduce a very special guest. He represents a growing movement within modern science that has played a significant role in my own faith journey. Many of you know that as a young pastor, I went through a season of intense doubt, so intense that I finally felt compelled to separate my search from my paycheck and resign my position. Without a doubt, one of the hardest things I've ever done. The journey back to faith led me down several paths. One that was immensely significant was science. What verifiable evidence was there that could point me either toward or away from God? Many of the loudest voices in our culture proclaim that science has disproved God. And yet, as I searched for answers, I discovered there were many distinguished scientists who were also men and women of faith, not in spite of science, but because of it, because of the evidence that points to an intelligent designer. The leading research organization in the world today making the scientific case for the theory of intelligent design is the Discovery Institute is based right here in Seattle, Washington. The work of scientists and philosophers related to the Discovery Institute was tremendously helpful in my search, and I am delighted today to have a member of Discovery as our featured speaker. Dr. Brian Miller is the research coordinator for the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics with a minor in Engineering from MIT, and a PhD in physics from Duke University. He speaks internationally on the topics of intelligent design and the impact of worldviews on society. He's also consulted on organizational development and strategic planning and is a technical consultant for The Startup, a virtual incubator dedicated to bringing innovation to the marketplace. Brian was also the co-author of the book, God's Not Dead, which became the basis for the movie by the same name. Burnett and I had the pleasure of spending a couple of days with Brian this past summer, showing him a bit of the peninsula. And we can vouch for the fact that he is not only a bright thinker, but also a great Christian brother. I believe you're going to enjoy what Dr. Miller has to share. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you today, and uh, my name is Brian Miller, and I have a PhD in complex systems physics, so uh, this sermon will be quite a bit different from what you're used to, because we'll be dealing a lot with the science. Because just to give you a little bit of my background, is I went to MIT as an undergraduate to study physics, and I was really challenged in my faith, because I wasn't prepared uh, to deal with a lot of the people that didn't believe that God existed. And what happened during my uh, freshman year is I read a book by a man named Richard Dawkins. And if you're not familiar with Richard Dawkins, he's one of the most prominent atheists in the world. And he wrote the book, The God Delusion, and I, I think that uh, the title speaks for itself. And what he argued is that when you look at nature, you might think you see design, but it's all an illusion. That everything is simply the product of the blind forces of nature. In fact, there's really an amazing quote by him uh, out of his book, uh, which was, out of Eden. And let me just read to you that quote. It was the universe we observe is precisely, has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And after I, I read Dawkins and, and just heard many other of my professors arguing against the Creator, I became pretty convinced that God didn't exist. In fact, I sort of bought into the idea that either you're a person of science and you pursued truth logically and you were driven by reason and scientific evidence, or you're a person of faith and just sort of believe things blindly. And that was really discouraging because when you read atheists, people like Lawrence Krauss, who's one of the more famous atheists, who's a physicist, he made this amazing statement. He said, we constitute a 1% bit of pollution in the universe, we are completely irrelevant. And that's what I realized, is that if God didn't exist, 
and it didn't matter if I was happy or sad or kind or cruel, I would die, all my memories would cease, and that would be true with everyone on the Earth. And eventually the universe would run, run out of free energy and essentially all life would cease to exist. And those are really dark thoughts for me as a freshman, but, but that was where I was. And I remember I said, God, I don't know if you exist, but if you do exist, you have to prove it to me because I'm a scientist. I just can't take things by faith. And I didn't know if that was against the rules, but what happened is God put me on a, on a path over the next several years. And I, I really believe he divinely directed my life to meet some of the top experts on issues of science, issues on the evidence for the truth of the Christian faith through history. And I came to realize that the evidence for the Christian faith is overwhelming, particularly in the evidence for science and how it points to a creator. Because while people have been told often that faith and science are in conflict, the, the truth is actually the exact opposite. In fact, here's a very famous quote by Albert Einstein, who said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe it is that that is, that is comprehensible. And that's truly extraordinary. Because if you look at the universe, you wouldn't necessarily expect that we would be able to understand it. Because if our brains simply came about by the blind forces of nature, why should we be able to understand things like general relativity or quantum mechanics, or at least a physicist be able to understand them? Um, it's really incredible because what people don't realize is that science was really birthed in Christian Europe because it was the Christian faith that allowed people to do science. Why is that? Because to study the order in the universe, you have to, one, believe that there is order, that there is a pattern that's actually able to be understood. And you also have to believe that we have the ability to understand that order. And the Christian faith teaches that we're created in God's image so God created us with the ability to understand the order that he created. Also, the Christian faith teaches that we are fallen. What that means is that we can't always trust our reason. And that led the, uh, the early scientists in Europe to do scientific investigation because the Greeks believed that they could figure out the universe just through reasons. So they didn't do empirical evidence. They didn't look for empirical evidence or experimental data. While the Christians realized that you can't trust yourself, so they actually studied the world and they realized a lot of what the Greeks thought was true based on their reason, like the idea that the Earth is in a perfect circular orbit around the sun, actually wasn't true. So it's really the Christian assumptions that allowed science to flourish in Europe. But even more than that, the more I studied science, what I realized is over the 20th century, the evidence for a designer became overwhelming. So many of you have probably heard of the Big Bang, and I'm not referring to the TV show with, with Sheldon and Penny, but the idea that the universe started a finite time in the past. And Christians will debate whether that was very long ago, billions of years, or was it more recent, but that's not the point. The point is that the science from general relativity demonstrates that the universe had to have had a beginning. And this was shocking to physicists. Since the time of even Aristotle, in the ancient Greeks, people thought the universe was eternal. And they liked that idea because if the universe was eternal, you didn't have to explain how it started. But what happened is because of the modern physics, they realized that all of time, matter, space, and energy all started a finite time in the past. What that means is that whatever started it had to be timeless and spaceless uh, and infinitely powerful, which sounds a whole lot like the God of the Bible. In fact, the fact that scientists realize that the universe began an explosion of energy sounds a lot like Genesis that talks about, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. But then the science is even more extraordinary because the more physicists studied our universe, the more they realize that our universe appears to have been designed with the purpose of supporting life. So it, it, just to use an analogy, imagine that you're given a universe starter kit for Christmas. And that looks a lot like a mixer board that you'd have in a music studio, where every single dial and knob would control some aspect of a universe you're gonna, you're gonna create. Um, like one dial could be the strength of gravity. So if you turn the dial up, you feel heavier. If you turn it down, you feel lighter. Another dial could be like the mass of an electron or the mass of a quark, or it could be the force between uh, electrons and, and protons. And imagine that you set all those dials at random and you, you hit a button and the universe started. The chances of that universe supporting life is just fantastically small because all these dials have to be set to support life. So for instance, if you look at, let's say, the force between 
uh, the, the electrons and the protons, so it's called the electromagnetic force. Or you look at the force that holds protons and neutrons together in a nucleus, which is called the strong nuclear force. Those forces have to be set to within a few percent, because if they're too small or they're too large, our universe wouldn't have enough carbon or oxygen to support life. Other dials on our universe starter kit have to be set much more precisely. In fact, gravity is pretty extraordinary because the precision to set gravity is incredible. You have to set it just right or else you wouldn't have stars that could support planets like our own. You couldn't support life with the, with the stability of a star and the right materials. So to understand how carefully you have to set it, imagine that you're, uh, you shoot a gun, you're a marksman, and you try to hit a target, which is one centimeter by one centimeter, at the other end of our solar system. The precision necessary to hit that target is the precision that gravity had to be set to allow for life in our universe. And there's several other examples I could, I could mention. Well, this revelation of how the universe appeared to be designed for life was shocking. In fact, there was um, a physicist named Fred Hoyle, who was an atheist, and he, uh, he thought that belief in God was just really ridiculous. But then after he studied the laws of nature and found out how they seem to be designed for life, he made this comment. He said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology, and that there is no blind forces uh, worth speaking about in nature. And the same revelation has been realized by many, many of the top level physicists in the world. But, but it, doesn't even, it doesn't stop there. It's not just that the universe had a beginning pointing to a creator. It's not just that the laws of nature appeared to be designed for life. But if you even look at our planet, our sun, our moon, our solar system, so many details about where we live had to be set perfectly or else life wouldn't exist. So for instance, the atmosphere has to have the right amount of oxygen. If there's too little, you couldn't have a complex life like humans because there wouldn't be enough energy that they could access. If there was too much oxygen, the oxygen would basically erode our cells in the same way an apple core turns dark over time. So the atmosphere is just perfect to allow us to breathe. In addition, the atmosphere allows the right type of radiation through. It allows heat, it allows sunlight so that plants can have photosynthesis so that we can stay warm, but it blocks out radiation like microwaves or high ultraviolet that would kill us. So again, the atmosphere is perfect for life. In addition, if you look at the magnetic shield we have, what happens is the, the magma in our planet rotates that creates a magnetic field and that protects us from uh, radiation from the sun. So without that magnetic shield, there wouldn't be life on earth. If you look at the moon, the moon is the right size, it's the right distance from, from the Earth to stabilize our orbit. Because if the moon wasn't just right, we would have uh, wind storms that could be a thousand miles per hour. We wouldn't have stable seasons. And you wouldn't have the, uh, the uh, ocean currents, things like high tide, low tide, that circulate the oxygen in the water to allow life at a very deep depth in the ocean. So again, more details. Also, Jupiter, we have these very, very large planets in our outer ring of our solar system, and what they do is they protect us from things like asteroids. If Jupiter wasn't there, we would have a far more collisions with Earth that would be very problematic for life. Um, our sun. Our sun produces the right type of radiation. It's highly stable uh, to allow for life. And even our solar system. We're in the perfect place in a spiral-armed solar system to live. If we were too close to the center, the radiation would kill us, things like supernovas and black holes. If we we're too far out, there'd be other problems. And, and life is only possible in a spiral or a spiral armed solar system. So again, we're in the perfect place in our solar system for life. But it's not just that, because our planet wasn't simply designed for life. It was designed for scientific investigation and cultural advancement. Because the fact that we have an atmosphere that's transparent means that we can see the stars so that we can do astronomy. The magnetic shield that protects us from radiation from the sun also allows us to navigate the oceans. So the magnetic, the magnetic, uh, the magnetic fields on our Earth allow us to use compasses. Uh, if you look at something like fire, not only is the oxygen just right to, to breathe, but it's just right to produce fire. Because if there were too much oxygen, 
we would burn down all our forests. A lot of like would happen in California during the summer. If there is too little oxygen, you couldn't produce fire. And fire is necessary for technology because you can melt metals and, and make tools. And of course, one of my favorite examples is the wavelength of light that penetrates our atmosphere, the wavelength that, that allows photosynthesis is perfect for vision. Because if the wavelength were longer, that basically if you have a wave with, uh, with a crest and a trough, if that wavelength were much longer, eyes would have to be the size of football fields for us to have high resolution vision. So again, you see this convergence of uh, details about our planet, our sun, our, our moon, the laws of physics that allow not just for life, but for scientific investigation and cultural advancement. And there's a couple of books coming out. Uh, one is The Return of the God Hypothesis. I've been helping with this book, and that'll be out next year. That'll cover a lot of the material I talked about with the laws of physics. And The Privileged Planet is a really good book that talks about our planet, our sun, and our moon. So these are just more references for uh, your interest. And of course, the other, issue, the other field of science, which is often considered uh, the most problematic for Christians is the issue of biology because people think that's an area where the science has shown that we're just simply an accident of nature and not the product of a designer. However, this isn't something that is actually true when you study the science because the question becomes, when you look at the design in life, is it real or, or an illusion? Because people since the ancient Greeks have looked at biology and said, we see very clear evidence of design. Um, and what happens is some people accepted the evidence at face value where others said, no, I, I don't believe in a creator. I don't believe there's design. So I'll argue that chance and time were enough to mimic the appearance of design. And this debate goes all the way back to like the fifth century BC, where you have people like in the fifth century, like, um, uh, D uh, Democritus versus people like Aristotle, or even at the time of Jesus, you have people like the Epicureans versus the Stoics who had that very same debate. Is the appearance of design something that's real or is it an illusion? And of course, when you get to more modern times, you have, Richard, you have people like um, uh, Charles Darwin. And what happened is Charles Darwin realized when you looked at life, you saw the appearance of design, but Charles Darwin was deeply influenced by the materialist philosophies of his day, the skepticism. The idea that there is no God that's involved in the world, that if God exists, he's very distant and uninvolved. So what Darwin did was he tried to reinterpret biology to argue against that there's real evidence for design. In fact, what he did was he read uh, people like William Paley. And if you're not familiar with William Paley, he had the famous watch argument where Paley said, if you find a watch in the forest, it has all these different parts that seem to be perfectly designed to fit together for a purpose. So that, that would tell you the watch was designed. And uh, he, he said, if you look at life, you see the same thing. You see any, any living system has lots of different parts that seem to be perfectly interconnected to serve a purpose. Now what Darwin did was he actually studied William Paley and he used the same language, the same logic, the same examples. But what he did was he replaced a creator with natural selection. So if you're familiar with natural selection, the idea is that in any population you have some uh, variation, like an example would be sheep. Some sheep have thicker wool, some have less thick wool. And what happens is nature presents a certain environment, like let's say a cold winter, and then those sheep with thicker wool would survive and those without thick wool would die. That's natural selection. The sheep with the thickest wool are, will survive. It's selected by nature. So over time, uh, sheep will have thicker and thicker wool. And what Darwin did is he said that process could explain all of the appearance of design in life. So it may look design, but it's not really designed because natural selection can mimic the role of a creator. And a famous quote about the implications was by Francisco Ayala. And he said, it was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the directive organization of living, uh, of living beings can be explained as a result of a natural process natural selection without any need to resort to a creator or other external agent. And that's been really accepted almost as a secular creation narrative that's been uh, promoted in Western civilization. But as it turns out, um, top level theorists now know that that claim is not true. There's actually a, a major conference from the Royal Society of London, which is one of the most prestigious scientific organizations in the world, the oldest. And it was uh, titled New Trends in Evolutionary Biology. And uh, people came together, top level theorists came together 
because what they realized is that what is taught in textbooks isn't actually true. In fact, the first speaker, Gert Mueller, uh, he uh, gave a wonderful talk where he talked about how natural selection or uh, what's called neo-Darwinism or the modern synthesis is really, really good at explaining things like the variation of the color patterns of tigers or uh, differences in spots on beetles, or differences in cichlid fishes in Lake Victoria. So it can explain how uh, evolution can take place to make very, very minor changes to something that already exists. What they realized is the Neo-Darwinian framework cannot explain the origination of anything novel, radical new creatures, like with radical new architectures, like the appearance of a worm, or a fly, or an echinoderm that they really have no explanation of how that could take place. And during the conference, they, they talked about a lot of different extensions to the theory. They talked about eyes like phenotypic plasticity, niche construction, developmental uh, bias, all those sorts of things. But there wasn't one shred of evidence presented that could explain how anything could transform dramatically or how anything truly novel could come about, like the appearance of eyes for the first time. Uh, and, and that's uh, really quite extraordinary. But there is additional evidence that has come over the last several decades that, that's reinforced this fact. Because if you look at the fossil record, Darwin expected that you'd have what's called a, a tree of life. That you'd have cells from long ago, they would evolve over time, you'd have different branches that represent the different branches in the tree of life, like animals versus plants. Those branches would have sub-branches, things like the vertebrates. They would have even smaller branches, like mammals versus uh, fish. So again, this is the idea of a tree of life. It's a slow, gradual development over millions and millions of years. But what happened is uh, people discovered what's called the Cambrian Explosion. And what they realized is that the first appearance of the major animal types that you see today, the first time you see something like a starfish, or the first time you see something like a fish, or something like a clam, that these new animals appeared suddenly in the fossil record with no precursors going back to the trunk of an evolutionary tree. So what you don't see is series of fossils leading from the first appearance of these radical new animal types back to the trunk of a tree. And in fact, uh, that's really quite shocking. And what they found is it's actually very, very common. So what you find is there's this famous paper by Eugene Koonin called the Biological Big Bang Model. He talked about how that's a general pattern in the fossil record. That when you look at the first time you see something radically new, like the first time you see something like an amphibian or the first time you see something uh, like uh, a giraffe or whatever you're looking at, it appears suddenly. And you don't see this gradual development over time. So that's a common pattern. And what's even more extraordinary is when mathematicians have said, well, how fast can evolution actually take place? And uh, this was a famous paper by Durrett, Durrett and Schmidt. And what they did is they looked at how fat long does it take for, let's say, two new mutations to appear in a population and then spread throughout that population. And if they're, if they're neutral, which is, it means they're not really advantageous or disadvantageous, the time it would take for two specific mutations to spread through a population would be on the order of like uh, 9 million years for fruit flies, which have very high populations and they reproduce really fast. So again, if you look in the fossil record, what you find is that the time available in the fossil record for these radical transformations to take place, like things just appear suddenly in the fossil record, the time available is only enough for like two specific mutations to appear and spread through the population. So this isn't taking place through a natural process. What you're seeing is clear evidence of a designer infusing nature with information, a creation taking place to produce new, uh, new creatures. And of course, uh, what happens is another problem is if you look at all mutations which produce some significant change, uh, the sorts of mutations that would create a change that would allow, let's say, a fish to become an amphibian, all of those mutations, without exception, if they produce some visible result, are harmful. There's not been one single mutation that's ever been observed which is non-harmful, that's created the type of change necessary to bring a radical transformation in life. So again, this idea that an evolutionary process can mimic the appearance of design is now pretty clearly false based on an overwhelming amount of scientific evidence. 
so so the, the question then becomes, okay, fine, so maybe a natural process can explain life. But do you actually see positive evidence for a design that really points to a creator? And the answer is we most certainly do. And what I'm going to do now is walk you through a little exercise. So uh, what I'm going to do is ask the question, how do you identify design in general? Like how would an archaeologist identify design? Or how would someone working for SETI who's looking at signals from space identify a signal that was produced by an alien intelligence? Or how do you know that the images or the, the sculptures on Easter Island are designed? And I'm going to walk you through an exercise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you four different images. And I want you to guess uh, how likely it is that that image is designed. So if you know it could be produced by the blind forces of nature, just chance and time and physical processes, you would list that as a one. You're certain it's not designed. While if you know it's designed, then you would say that's a 10. So a 10 means that you would bet your life, your family's life, that this was designed by an intelligence. So I'm going to show you a picture, and then you're welcome to, to stall the video and ask what number would you choose. So this is the image on Mars. OK, so most of you probably knew that the image on Mars was not designed because it's an image on Mars. But it's a shocking to me how many people actually think it might have been. But again, if you look at this image, it's sort of vaguely like a face, but it's not very specific. It's very fuzzy. And if you actually looked at the image in high resolution, it wouldn't look like a face at all. So that's not design. That's just from meteorites uh, and other natural processes. OK, here's the second image. OK, this image is designed. It was produced as part of a wall of a fort. Now, most of you probably knew it was designed, but I'm guessing you wouldn't bet your life on the fact that it was designed because there's that slight possibility that perhaps water or erosion or something like that could have produced it. So it is designed, but it's not completely obvious. Here's another image. Now, this image is a little bit tricky. Because I bet a lot of you were pretty confident that it was designed. You may have had like a seven, eight, or nine, but it's actually not. It's actually just a, a, it's actually produced by the natural attractions of the molecules in this geode. So what you have is something that looks like a cross, but it's not actually designed. It's an illusion. Now, what may have clued you into the fact it wasn't designed was the fact that you have irregularities. It's inside of a rock. Um, natural processes are very good at creating geometric shapes. So it, it looked like design, but you probably were suspicious, and that suspicion would have been right. OK, here's the last image. So look at this one really carefully. OK, I'm suspecting all of you knew that this was designed. And even if you didn't know that it was, uh, it, it was a famous monument, Mount Rushmore, you would know it was designed because, one, uh, the faces on this mountain are very different from the natural rock face. While the natural rock face is more irregular and jagged, it's, these are very smooth and very sharp curves. So it looks very different from what nature would normally do. It's also highly improbable. It's extremely unlikely that you're going to get faces that close to human faces based on wind and erosion. Um, but most importantly, it, 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 it's images that you recognize you know that these are the faces of presidents. And they're not just sort of fuzzy faces that sort of crudely look like presidents, but they have very sharp details that perfectly match the images of, pres of presidents. So it has what's called specified complexity. It's very complex, it's very improbable, but it's very specified that it points to a specific uh, category of images that we can recognize. So again, there's no question that this is designed. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you um, a video and I want you to use the same method of design detection that you did with these other images and ask yourself, does this look designed or not? It's been called one of the wonders of the molecular world, an amazing nanoscale machine. ATP synthase is a high-tech micromolecular power generator inside the cells of your body. It generates adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, an energy molecule that provides fuel that every one of your cells needs to function. Without this fuel, your cells will cease operation, and so will you. ATP synthase works like a rotary engine. The barrel-shaped rotator is composed of 10 to 15 protein parts called subunits. The rotator spins around, transmitting mechanical energy into the drive shaft of the machine, which helps make ATP. 
This drive shaft has a specially placed bump that opens and closes parts as the drive shaft spins around. This bump opens special protein subunits on the bottom of the machine. When the bottom subunits open, a spent energy molecule called adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, enters the machine. The mechanical motion causes the ADP to bind with an additional phosphate group, creating the ATP energy molecule. And the ATP drifts off into the cell, ready to power some biomechanical reaction. The ATP synthase machine has many parts we recognize from human-designed technology. A rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, and other basic components of a rotary engine. The ATP synthase is one of thousands of elegantly designed molecular machines inside your cells that make your life and all known life possible. Okay, now when you look at that what's called an ATP synthase, um, and you ask the question, does it look designed? You will see evidence of design, which is the same evidence that, that convinced you that Mount Rushmore is designed. You have something that is not produced by natural process. There's no physical law that creates molecular machines. It's something that's highly improbable. Uh, if you looked at even one component of that molecular machine, it's made from what are called proteins, and proteins are the building blocks of cells. And what a protein is, is, is simply a long chain of what are called amino acids. And there's 20 amino acids in the same way you have like 26 letters in the alphabet. And what happens is when you have a long chain of amino acids with the right uh, sequence, it'll fold into the three-dimensional structure, which is one of the components of that machine. And if you ask the question, how likely is it for a random uh, uh, sequence of amino acids to form a functional part of a machine like that? Uh, there's some, some uh, research that was done by people like Doug Axe, and I've sort of expanded on that analysis from people like Dan Toffick from the Weizmann Institute. And what you find is the probability of a random sequence forming a functional protein that could be used in a machine like that, it's kind of like if you mark a single atom in uh, a million galaxies, and then you randomly pick that atom purely by chance. That's the probability that a random sequence of amino acids will form a component of that, function, of that molecular machine. So it's not something that can happen by chance. And also, it demonstrates purpose. It, 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 it matches what we're familiar with. It looks like rotary motors that we create. We can even, identi we can even identify the parts. Uh, so by all the criteria that you used in identifying Mount Rushmore as designed, or all the criteria anyone uses to identify design in the world, this looks designed. So there's very clear objective evidence that you're dealing with the creator who designed life for his purpose. Uh, the area where I'm really an expert is the issue of the origin of life. Uh, and what's, uh, what's interesting about the origin of life is what's clear is that's a physical impossibility for the first cell to come about by a blind process. Because all uh, natural processes do one of two things. Either you go from order to disorder, and that, that's kind of like the idea that if you have a room, it's much easier to keep your room messy than to keep it neat. You have to have energy put in to keep your, neat, your room neat. And in, in the same way, all natural processes go to greater entropy. And entropy is just, is just greater disorder, crudely speaking. Uh, a second tendency is nature tends to go from high energy to low energy. So water runs downhill, it doesn't run, up, run uphill. Uh, high energy molecules tend to break apart into smaller molecules. And every single process in the entire universe always goes to either higher entropy or lower energy or both. The problem is a cell is both high order or low entropy and high energy. There's lots of energy in those chemical bonds. So it's a physical impossibility for simple chemicals on the early earth to become a cell. Uh, in addition, what you find in the origin of life is very clear pictures of design because uh, the, the simplest possible cell had to have information and DNA. And why is that? Well, I talked about how proteins are long sequences of amino acids. And those amino acid sequences have to have lots of information, the right sequence, in the same way that 
a, a series of letters in a paragraph have to be in the right order for it to be a readable paragraph, those uh, proteins have to have information for it to fold into the right three-dimensional shapes to do what the cell needs it to do. But in addition, proteins break apart uh, relatively quickly. Uh, so in, in a few years, your typical protein is going to break apart in, in the ancient Earth. So you've got to keep making new proteins. You have to keep repairing them. So you have to have the sequences of amino acids encoded into DNA. So DNA includes the instructions of how to build all the machinery in the cell and how to operate it. The DNA is what helps to direct the, the speed of chemical reactions. Without that oversight, a metabolism would simply break apart. A cell would simply break apart. And what happens is DNA is a, basically a language of four letters, A, C, T, and G, and it's the encoded information for your proteins and for other purposes. And if you look at the simplest possible cell that could exist, that's talking about a billion bits of information. That's like a billion letters, uh, ones and zeros in computer speak or, or, um, or A, C, T, and G in, in DNA. And information, at least large amounts of information, is always the product of a mind. So I don't know if you've ever gotten a butt text. That means that someone sat on their phone and they kind of wiggle it around and you got a text with just random symbols. You would know that wasn't produced by an intelligent agent. That was an accident. But if you got a, a, a text that said, don't tell anybody, but I cheated on the test, you would know that didn't happen by chance, that that was designed because that amount of information only comes from a mind. Or another analogy I like to use is uh, that of alphabet soup. Now imagine that you're, that you're sick and your, your mother or your spouse asked you to come down for lunch and you see this beautiful bowl of alphabet soup. But the letters in the soup are arranged into a, a sentence, drink plenty of fluids and rest until you are feeling better. Is it possible to explain that information by the chemistry of the pasta or the uh, physics of the boiling water? Obviously not. That information is only a product of a mind. In fact, Richard Dawkins, in looking at DNA, made an amazing comment. He said, the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Apart from differences in jargon, the pages of Molecular Biology Journal uh, might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. And, and that's very telling, because remember, Richard Dawkins is not an evangelist, he's not a Christian, he's an atheist, an atheist evolutionist. Yet he looks at DNA and knows it looks like computer code. It looks like what's the product of engineering. And that's very telling because engineers or computer scientists typically don't use random number generators to produce what they want to produce. Uh, and also um, uh, Bill Gates made an equally striking comment. He said, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any we've ever created. So again, what you're seeing is information points to design as unambiguously in DNA as it would in my example, the alphabet soup or text message. In fact, when you look at origin of life researchers, it's pretty amazing because if you look at people um, like uh, Michael Russell, who is one of the leaders of, the, of origin of life, he had an amazing, uh, some amazing statements in, in an article that he wrote, a two-part article with his colleague. And I won't go through the quote, but basically he says, it's a theoretical impossibility for a cell to form or even a biochemical reactions to form purely through the laws of chemistry and energy inputs. It's not going to happen. So how does he explain life? This is an amazing statement. Well, th uh, this is incredible. In fact, I am actually going to read this. Uh, it says, instead, we claim it had to have been launched simple and specific and thereafter have been forced by the scythe of natural selection to maintain the necessary specificity standard at each evolutionary increment in complexity. More specifically, all the devices of life, metabolic and structural, must have been invented by it in situ, step by step, while in flight, starting from the simplest possible inputs. And learning itself by trial and error, which small changes themselves occurring by chance were useful, each incremental step in this evolution by creeps, complexity building process necessary be being vetted by the system, both for fitting in and for contributing more utility and cost. So this is amazing. These origin of life researchers are talking about basically a chemical soup in a thermal vent. And so there's nothing even reproducing. So the whole idea that natural selection could help it makes absolutely no sense. But what they, they know that design is required to produce a cell, but they don't believe in a designer. So what they do is they invoke natural selection, not as a real process, because again, nothing is reproducing. 
but more like a demigod that has the intelligence to create the first cell. So what you're seeing is origin of life researchers are acknowledging that the first life required intelligent design, but they don't want to refer to a designer, so they use words like self-organization or natural selection as, a, as basically a way to smuggle design into their research. Um, now, what's also very interesting is if you look at a field called systems biology, what's taking place is systems biologists are realizing that when you look at life, the nature of the design in life is the opposite of what people would expect through an evolutionary process. So I won't read the quotes due to time, but basically uh, this particular evolutionist is saying that biology is sick because there's this temptation by biologists to talk about uh, structures in life as if they had a purpose, if, if, there, if there's what's called teleology, which is just a philosophical word for design. He says you should stop it because, because it's not design, it just came about. Any attempt to look for a purpose is misleading is the basic point of this article. Um, um, also what happened is biologists assumed that life would be uh, suboptimal. It would demonstrate poor design, clumsy design, because it's being produced by this random process. There's no way that nature should pr produce the best possible design that there could be. So they assume that there's lots of errors in the human body, lots of clumsy design. You may have heard um, back in like the 80s that people believe that like 95, 98% of human DNA was non-functional. It was just junk DNA. And that has to be the case. Because according to evolution, you have to have all this junk DNA that's not doing anything because that's kind of your laboratory to explore different sequences that might do something functional. There's a great paper by David Snoke in the journal Complexity that talks about how uh, an, an evolutionary process will always produce lots and lots of useless junk and suboptimal design. Um, but what's happened is the more that biologists have looked at life, they see the truth is the exact opposite. They looked that the design they see in life is the best design that humans know how to design. So if you look at what humans do, what you see in life is the best that humans know how to design. Uh, except often in biology, it's superior to our design. Um, what you find is this whole idea of imperfection is now known to be false. Um, in fact, I mentioned the idea that people used to believe that uh, most of the human DNA was junk DNA. Well, the ENCODE project has actually shown that our DNA is not mostly junk. And they found that 80% of it is useful, and that percentage just keeps going up. The more we learn, the more we see that DNA is optimized for life. And, and, and certain biologists, uh, like Dr. Grauer, said, said that if ENCODE is right, evolution must be wrong, because DNA cannot have that much non, cannot have so much high functional DNA for, for evolution to be true. If evolution is true, it should almost all be junk. Um, here's another great quote. What they find is that the design in life is much, much different than, than human engineering, but here's how it's different. In this chapter, we adopted a high-level view of cellular systems by combining biology and engineering approaches. This perspective does not want to disguise the large differences between the two types of systems. In fact, biology often shows a more remarkable design than technology. And I won't go through the rest of the quotes, but you can actually just read them at your leisure. Um, but this particular paper shows how when you look at life, you see what looks like an embedded computing system. And the basic design logic you see in embedded computing systems you see in life. And again, this goes back to scripture. And this is really one of my favorite scriptures. It's John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And this verse is, is really uh, sums up this idea of the design behind creation. Because it talks about how Jesus was with God the Father. The Trinity was at the very moment of creation. And he has been involved in every aspect of our world. And it talks about how the Word was involved in creation. And you really see this idea of word is, is very similar to the concept of information. And you see the idea of information in life, information in DNA, information in the design of living organisms, and even information in the very laws of physics. 
So what you see is that nature does not look like it's the product of blind, pitiless indifference, like Richard Dawkins said. It doesn't look like an accident, but it, it, it reveals very clearly that God created us with a purpose. He created our planet with a purpose, that everything in creation points back to design. And the idea isn't simply to see the design and, and just to marvel at it, although it's incredible, but the design is meant to point us back to the, to the designer because God wants not just for us to know that he's the creator, but he wants to be the light of our life. It talks about how Jesus is the light of the world. He brings life and God wants to know us personally. So he would rec that we would recognize that not only is our body designed, but he has a purpose for our very lives. And it's in knowing that purpose and knowing our creator that's the true meaning of life. You were the word at the beginning And one with God, the Lord most high You're hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You did it. What? 